I have no slides, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm extremely grateful to John for uh, inviting me to join this debate. And I hope it will be a conversation, so I won't speak for too long. I want to start with the, the question about the politics. It seems to me that uh, working as I do in a sort of strategy team in a central public administration institution, the European Commission, the challenge, as Jeff Mulgan put it after he sort of had been in number 10 for Blair and wrote The Art and Science of Strategy, the, the challenge is to get politicians who are always mired in crisis to think about the systemic long-term challenges on which they need to be leading their constituencies towards a chosen, safe, or better outcome. And at the moment, we're exactly not in that position. It's hard enough to see the sort of the Mulgan prescription, you know, 50% politicians will be looking at today, 30% next week. If you can get 20% focused on the remainder of their mandate, you've done your job. And at the moment in crisis-ridden European member states and at the European institutional level, people are fretting about quite important things like Syria, migration, Euro crisis, etc., and not thinking, therefore, in a systemic joined up way about problems like this. So the, 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 the reason I was fascinated to join this is not that I have deep insights in it, but one of the political implications is kindly let's think about this seriously and in a joined up way. Uh, if I then come, I, I, I was very pleased that you mentioned Brian Arthur. I mean, if we then come to that, we have to think in a long term way, but be a little bit modest. One of the things I took away from reading Arthur is technology is an autopoietic system. In other words, technology will do what it's going to do, and you'll be in a conversation between humanity and technology. You shouldn't assume that you can predict what technology is going to do and then control it. And that, of course, is also what politicians never, ever recognize. So we have the, the home and justice ministers of the European member states sitting together saying, terrorists might use... Bitcoin to move money around. We don't like terrorists, so we must prohibit Bitcoin, prohibit Bitcoin in order to make the world a safer place. So um, the, the political implications, therefore, are on the one hand, we need to see how it joins up, and this is a systemic challenge. So it's not just about there's one shock to the system, which is employment displacement, and then there's a consequence. It's much more complicated, but we have to think about it with all due modesty, there may not be answers, and if there are answers, they will be formed in a society-wide debate and not by any single fiat from government or anyone else. Uh, if I then come a bit to the substance, I think um, here we're focusing on white-collar employment, but it's worth just having in the back of our minds what sorts of technological displacements are being driven by digital today. And there's another report which you'll see up on the websites over Davos, which, which I had some hand in, which is what is software going to do? What are the tipping points in software-driven change across the economy over the next 10 to 20 years? And that gives you some flavor of what's going on. But I think you can see three uh, mechanisms of displacement. One is the marginal capacity uh, economy. So digitally enabled, Airbnb, that sort of thing, marginal physical capacity. You then have either marginal human capacity or the gig economy, think of it as you like, sort of mechanical Turk, task rabbit type phenomena where you have digitally enabled freelance, and in a way Uber drivers are somewhere in between those two. And then you have artificial intelligence not as the machine driving those sharing relationships, but as a machine that will do away with most of the banks, most of the doctors, etc., etc. So that's going to come more slowly, but be a deeper threat. And the leading edge, the sort of gig and marginal capacity business models are here today. And so we have to think about the, the technological displacement with different timescales and different mechanisms in place. Uh, then I'd just like to put down some questions. Will the state disappear? Will the worker disappear? Will national income disappear? And will sectors disappear? If I start with the last one first, it's clear that the categories that we use, whether for employment or for 
uh, share prices in the back of the FT are blurring. Sectors, as we understand them, are disappearing as everything goes cyber-physical. Banks are over the top for telcos and for home management. Google is trying to take over other stuff. Your telephone company would like to be your payment provider. So one of the complexities in judging this uh, displacement effect is that we're looking at the displacement of defined job categories in defined sectors, but actually those categories and sectors themselves are merging, making it quite hard to run um, predictive models and say how big the problem is. So I think that's just a, a yet another caveat. Will the state disappear? We can all now become e-citizens of Estonia. That's a very clever, not yet fully monetized, aggressive play. Estonia isn't invading the rest of the world. It's offering citizens of the rest of the world a way out of whatever position they happen to be in today. It's not as simple as just going online and opening an Amazon account, but it's a signal that the meaning of the state and the geolocation of regalian activities is itself in doubt. Will the worker disappear? One of the worries I think people have about the uh, digitally enabled economy is it's by definition black. It may not be accessible to measurement and control. And I think that it's clear that in the future, whether you're talking about white class, sorry, about white collar employment or other, you're going to face a future where potentially a greater part of economic activity in the territory that you may wish to control and measure and tax could escape your control unless you get ahead of the technology curve and you use, for example, blockchain technology to enable and to require by law registration, digital contracts for your one-hour gigs, and at the conclusion of those contracts, the execution of payment, income taxation, national insurance over the same technology. And so the question there is absolutely one where a vision of the future could save the state because if we get ahead of the changes which are going on, work may well be displaced, it may well become more subterranean, but it will not necessarily be able to escape organization by the community. But the final point is most, the most interesting, I think, will income disappear? At the moment, I can do 100 pounds worth of work for a company under two status uh, models. One is I work for the company, and in this country that means probably it costs somewhere around £145 to the company for me to do work that earns me £100. And I can do it as a, as a contractor for that same company, as a self-employed contractor, and it will cost the company about £125, roughly. So what happens in between? The logic in today's world is we don't... Uh, tax the self-employed the same, they don't get the same social safety net, we sort of assume that's the liberal professions, the people who can look after themselves, and it's marginal. Mainly we say it's the salariat, we know where they work, we know how long they work, and it's cost efficient to tax and to, um, to, to subsidize the welfare state from that work because we know where to find the people and we know where to find the companies. In the gig economy, you don't know which model to apply. Even the very clever judges in California can't work out if an Uber driver is model A or model B. And so there's a huge question there. What shall the state do about that? Do we create a third category, which is what the French are beginning to think about? Or do we say, in the coming world, there should only be a single category, which personally I would think is the more logical step, to say, you know, you're going to be taxed the same way whether you're self-employed or not. But you can imagine the huge incumbency pressures against that because it either means that companies' uh, costs will go up if we level up to the, uh, to the employed salariat model or the income of the welfare state will go down if we align on the self-employed model. So we might need to split the difference in terms of the nature 
of a future tax and funding model. But I think personally, and I'll stop there, my instinct is we need to go to a single model rather than to, to begin trying to chase after technology and say, because there seems to be something going on in the gap between self-employed and salariat models, we're going to invent a third model. And I think then we'll have to invent a fourth and a fifth, and we'll end up with one after a very messy transition. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll sit down here so I can see the slide okay. and then come back up. Thank you very much. We, we, uh, we intend this to describe the size of the hall to run the diverse side of the conversation. Um, so if you have something to say, please, uh, please say it, and, and it would be nice to hear it. Can I start? One of, the, one of the big questions about this technology at the moment is that in, other, in some areas, the, the transformation happens very quickly. Um, now, perhaps that's because it only happens when information is there. So, for example, when you think of Facebook, say, uh, it didn't exist. Uh, it existed 10 years ago, just about. Um, and it now has more members than there are people in, in India, certainly. Um, and that all happens in a very, in a very short space of time. Now, in those circumstances, um, I can't see ways in which we could have states or states can deal with that pace of change. Now, I'm not saying that that would happen in relation to employment, but, but there's a sense in which states move very slowly, uh, and this stuff moves at least quicker than before. And the idea that the state might get ahead of this in some intelligent way seems to me implausible. So I, I think that the only thing worse than the regulator's inability to get ahead of technological change would be a world where the regulator was in front. And, you know, we've seen... We, and I say that as a lifelong bureaucrat. I, we, we saw it in the 19th century with the automobile in this country where the state literally got in front and the man had to walk with a red flag 120 yeah. yards in front yeah. of the engine. Um, and even that only slowed down the advance of technology. So I don't think the regulator or government will get ahead of individual changes. I do think that there, if we had a vision of the future we want, in other words, if we decided that we are embracing change but upholding our values of a, um, a, an employment-funded welfare state, then we have options. We can go for the Finnish model, which says, let's guarantee, the question that they're discussing, let's guarantee household income as a given. Uh, you can go for the sort of model I was describing, where you legislate for blockchain-based contracts and you align self-employed with salariat at some level of tax and subsidy. But if we don't take those decisions, then we'll be too far behind. But I, I don't think you need to be um, controlling in a, in a sort of obligatory way any particular technology coming to market. We have to look, as you are looking in this symposium, at the systemic impacts and try and deal with them. And there the state is ahead. The state does tell you what social security should you pay, what income tax should you pay. individual might be able to move around and pick the EU citizenship that gives them the, de the best sort of or lowest tax rates. And so I wonder if we're trying to get ahead of the technology, how would that sit with your third model? Because presumably the third model is couched in where you're a citizen, but if you can choose another, you know, thinking about the European Union and the free movement of workers, that kind of ideal, how would it sit with this e citizenship as that develops? But if you think about if you think about Task Rabbit or the Mechanical Turk, I mean, I can be sitting in my office in Belgium working uh, on uh, English employment policy for a Japanese university. So if they pay me, where am I taxed? I'm probably taxed. Probably today I would be taxed in Belgium. But I think that in the internet economy, we are in any case getting to the stage where work telework is going to put individual earners in the same sort of situation as multinationals are. And the OECD process of the last couple of years seems to have illuminated that in a helpful way, 
but it leads me to think that ultimately we're going to get back to the position for corporate tax that taxation should fall where the profits are earned. Now, whether we can actually enforce that on, on corporations is extremely unclear. But again, if you got ahead of the curve and, and had a, uh, a geography agnostic regime for income tax for individuals, then I don't think Estonia is offering uh, fiscal domicile as part of the e-citizen package yet, but it might. There are countries in the world where you might feel that you were better off uh, saying, okay, I am uh, fiscally resident in Estonia for the purposes of my online work and not in Lagos or, or in Luton. And just um, following up for that a bit, um, do you know of governments in, say, in the European Communion, in the Europe European Commission, in the European Community, who um, have units within them that think about this stuff in the way, in, in the sense, in the spirit that you're you're um, you're envisaging? Well, I guess in many in many governments there are people thinking about it a bit, but not at a level where decisions are made. So that's the 50, 30, 20 dilemma. 20 is, in fact, zero. Um, I think if you go to, I mean, in London, if you go to the Bank of England, there are people playing with some of these ideas quite um, yep. thoughtfully in the Treasury. But it's not being debated at cabinet level. And indeed, I don't think this is something that government should primarily be doing on its own. I think this is a big social debate. So you would really want a sort of Blair-esque big tent into which people were pouring these thoughts. What, what struck me a lot is the discrepancy between the long-term view that these companies, that, for example, companies like Google have now. They really seem to think long-term. And uh, the, the difference between that and, and um, most democratic governments in Western societies, anyway, um, who are driven very largely by, by electoral cycles. Yes. But I think that, so, the, the, one of the things which... Uh, this country's government is doing, which the Commission is getting behind as well, is trying to link up the foresight capacity of different administrations so that we get some sort of collective intelligence about these sorts of longer-term trends. Uh, in the Commission, so it's anecdotal, but there are 30 directorates general, probably only three or four of them do serious, sustained foresight work. But in the last two years, we've put together a thing called ESPAS, which is uh, yet another Euro acronym, but it brings together the Council of Ministers and the Parliament and the Commission's foresight people. So you, you're beginning there to network across foreign policy, tech futures, and that, I think, is a way forward. And I think in, in, in the UK the, there are people doing that, and in France and a little bit in Spain and, one, and Germany. But it's not even that is not yet going upwards to say this now needs to be decided. The opportunities here arise in the, uh, in the current debate on uh, employment and skills strategy with Mrs. Tyson in charge, where logically there should be some stuff coming out about skills for a digital future and not just skills for PowerPoint. Mm. Mm. We've had that here quite a lot. Comments? You raise <coughs> the uh, question of what states can do what their role is in, 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 in the midst of this turmoil. Uh, and one thing they've always done since at least the early 19th century is try to assist in the management of occupational change by providing or overseeing education systems mm -hmm. to skill and reskill the workforce. Mm. And I wonder whether you think that role still works given the speed of change. Now, whether those systems can it out fast enough to perform the role that once they did of um, easing the process of change. And to put the point up the other way, in countries like ours, which have 40 to 50% participation rates now in higher education, the premium return on the, on, the, on the cost of that education to the users is likely to become much more varied in the future, with some winning a great deal and a great number not benefiting from that investment. And are we likely now to have, facing the EU countries, a growing population of 25 to 35-year-olds 
in the future with large debts and no jobs as a consequence, which will not be a con contribution to political stability, I wouldn't have thought. Mm. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the sad future. I, mean, I think if we, look at, if we look at the state of the education system across the OECD figures, uh, one shocking fact is that if you look at not, not literacy and numeracy, I'll come back to that, but if you look at problem solving skills, the sorts of basic capacity which enable individuals to train and retrain and remain productive and valuable during their lives, the average school leaver in the Netherlands and Finland scores better than the average graduate in the UK, Italy, and Spain. And that's the average, so not a place like this, ladies and gentlemen, but it tells you something really shocking about complacent underperformance in the tertiary sector of at least three big member states, as well as probably poster child excellence in the secondary systems of some other uh, states. If you then go back to primary level, the same sort of questions arise. Um, because although UNESCO tells the world that in Western Europe we are 98% literate, functional illiteracy is 10 to 15% in every Western European country. Functional illiteracy, functional enumeracy, let alone digital illiteracy, which can be up to 40%. And you can say, that's all right, people will learn, and the oldies will die out, and the figures will get better. But there is a significant chunk of working age non-migrant um, non uh, citizens who are uh, more or less betrayed by the state education system today, including in this country, by the age 10. And then we ignore them when we talk about high-end skills. So if you bring those two things together, the problem is big enough without technological displacement. With technological displacement, the premium on creativity, embedded cognitive ability, things which primary schools are not necessarily focusing on, will increase. So the, 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 the 25, 35 year olds won't necessarily be bereft of jobs, but the ones that will be able to obtain and keep uh, sustainable employment income may not be the ones who've gone to second-rate universities. And indeed, I think you can already see a sort of trembling on the edge as to whether uh, a university education is in itself worth the investment all the time. And, and maybe, you know, so that, that's a question. But what, what is very clear, I would say, is that the early years are definitely worth it. Some countries do it well. You know, Finnish kindergarten, brilliant. Rovio, the people who make Angry Birds, have done a sort of online version of Finnish kindergarten. Can't sell it anywhere in Europe because it's not invented here. They can sell it in Tanzania with some development aid. They can sell it in Singapore. They can sell it in Shenzhen. So there are good things to copy across Europe, but they're not being copied across Europe. They're being copied elsewhere. We're talking about technological displacement. And we talk about politicians, policymakers, council of ministers, or there was, uh, John said, give me a break. That's come from the academics. But we know from Facebook, Google car, or what excites the AI people or the machine learning group is the automation. Shouldn't we somehow or the other include the AI scientists, technologists, machine learning, to think about these big problems and see whether we can design systems which can harness both the human and technology capacity to look at the big issues of employment. And shouldn't they be part of the policy makers? Mm -hmm. Or should Cambridge or other universities train the AI scientists in policy making? in looking at these social problems. Oh, ethics, fine, but ethics is about employment. That's the biggest ethical challenge. Shouldn't they be now say, okay, now let's think about these rather than autonomous Google systems or machine systems. What do you think about it? So I think from a research policy point of view, 
I would say that's what Europe is doing. So in the sense that we have in our legal framing of so-called Horizon 2020 research, the commitment to responsible research and innovation. And in, in the name of that principle, we are funding, certainly in, in the big data AI field, specific projects to bring AI and the systemic societal impacts together. So this is something which is, which is underway. Give me one example. Sorry? Give me one example. Maybe I'm bringing these to, to look so, at. Uh, so that's one example. There's a, call, there's a call for research this year in the impact of big data on societal systems. So, it, and it's not yet out. It's going to come in the course of 2016. So people in the room might even want to apply. Uh, so, so, but that's a very small thread but it is a research issue. The, the second thing to say, I think, is that when we think about the ethics of this, and we, we're all, I mean, we, I didn't say it because I think other speakers will, will address it with more knowledge than me, but you know, when I was young as a non-economist, economists were telling me the lump of labor fallacy is a fallacy. And I'm not aware that the fallacious nature of the lump of labor um, concept has changed in the 21st century. So. And if middle class jobs as defined today are entirely displaced, if the salariat is entirely replaced by freelance, then the, the, the sort of ethical and strategic thought experiment to play is not just let's assume that's true, but what happens next? Uh, what happens next is everybody needs a living wage. Everybody wants decent, socially useful, employment. Whether the two things go together is debatable. In Finland, that's why they're saying, what if the state gave every household a minimum income, thus freeing the link between a decent wage and useful work? And then the community can define useful work up to a point, cutting it from the question, is the hourly rate enough to pay my bills at the end of the month, and allowing people to do a broader range of things. If, if, back to primary education, they've remembered to learn how to play instruments and do poetry, and they've learned the interpersonal skills to do things as a community, which we've kind of forgotten. So I think that, on the one hand, bringing ethicists and AI together is an important research interdisciplinary venture, which we're beginning to do. But on the other, when you bring them together, the, the, the framing of the assumptions is, is non-trivial. And, and, and I think there's a huge debate to be had there, which is the debate we've always had when you say there's leisure, how will we use it? Is leisure a bad thing? So work as in you know, the, the, the fall of man after the Garden of Eden, you're bad, so you have to work. Um, or is leisure a good thing and to be aspired to, but then you have to also be trained and educated for it? many, many years ago in, in that essay on the economic possibilities for our grandchildren, because the thing that, I mean, this is an extraordinary essay, um, and he, he says in it that essentially we, we can assume that someday um, the problem of earning a living will be solved by technology, and in those circumstances, people will have a lot of leisure, and the question was, you know, how, how, should, how should they live a good life? Um, and from that came things like the Arts Council, which he, he, he founded, and the Arts Theatre in this town, and, and, and so on. Um, but but there's, there's a different angle on this in relation to, to the technologies we're talking about now. Um, in the last few weeks, there's been a big, big controversy on the net, sparked by an essay written by Paul Graham, who's both a sort of a Silicon Valley philosopher, I guess, and, and, and a successful investor. And he started off the essay by saying, I am a manufacturer of inequality. That's what he, because, because he, he funds, he, he incubates and funds um, companies that sometimes um, become extremely successful. And, and his view was that m many of these uh, companies do not uh, create um, employment in the way that companies used to do. Uh, in fact, quite the reverse. Um, so if you, if you just pursue that then and push it a bit further, supposing, supposing the evangelists of this stuff are right, supposing that, that uh, middle-class employment does, in fact, evaporate quite quickly in some sectors, um, and, and it will be replaced by, by uh, computation of some kind. Um, what then happens to the resulting gains in productivity? Okay. Um, 
under our present arrangements, most of those would flow to the people who own the kit. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, now, in those circumstances, what should a state be thinking about? Should it be thinking about saying, look, we can't have all of the, all of the, um, the, the, the proceeds of, of this uh, huge increase in productivity going simply to the small number of institutions yeah. which, which own the kit. Yeah. Um, do you, can you ima imagine an argument along those lines? Absolutely. I think that it, in a way, I think that that argument is implicit in the Finnish experiment. Right. So if you want to guarantee a minimum income per household, presumably still within the territory of your state, that may mean that you increase the taxation. Uh, we go back to my point about the third model. Maybe the third model is a bad idea. We need a single model, and you would then run it at the top level of tax and not a lower level of tax. And in terms of corporate taxation, the taxation wouldn't fall where the AI sits, but where the profits are made, logically. So, so you'd want a country of destination uh, and a country of, 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 of consumption uh, logic rather than the current games of, of yep. bets. So it would imply a massive reorganization of the global taxation system, perhaps. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah, okay. Charles. Sorry, just to follow up John's point, I mean, um, how exactly would that global reorganization of the tax system happen? Because you can see that uh, America, where a lot of that AI would sit, um, would want to hang on to its um, very uh, light touch system. Um, and, I mean, I'm not sure how Finland uh, organizes its tax system, you know, how it does that, but, but you can see all the stresses within the, uh, within the EU with uh, Ireland being used as a tax base by uh, a lot of the technology companies and funnel, funnel uh, money through to there. Um, maybe on the hook for some big tax bills retrospectively, but equally, you know, they, it's much easier for a multinational to be in multiple places than it is for an individual, and that's generally why governments have taxed individuals um, more, more effect effectively than they have um, multinationals. Yes, so I mean, we're now way beyond my, my zone of knowledge, so you're just getting what anybody you ask in the pub would answer to such a question, and I'm sure... Other speakers have thought about it more deeply than I have. But what you can see happening today in the country of destination shift for VAT, that's a very interesting um, ex example of how digital changes everything. When Lord Cofield proposed the single market, uh, he said we need to have harmonized country of origin taxation in order to avoid the transaction costs for businesses of dealing with different tax rates depending on where they're selling to. So either you harmonize or you have country of origin. And for VAT, it was, a, it was harmonized within bands and country of origin. Now you can do it all with a machine. So we have a machine called Vatmos, the mini one-stop shop. It's a prototype, it's clunky, it's gonna get better, which enables a small trader to uh, simultaneously uh, have calculated for it and settled at the end of each month the different tax rates of a country of destination VAT business. And so it will go on. In other words, in digital, the country of destination will become the logical place. The transaction costs will no longer be an argument. Uh, in respect of corporate taxation, I think that's a that's corporate taxation of corporate profits. That's a different layer. But the first layer you'll see, I would argue, in terms of revenue raising, would be a huge VAT on country of destination for service consumption. You could imagine. And that you can capture. So, um, I think, and, and uh, again, to the extent that blockchain type, uh, trustless, incorruptible, automatic uh, bookkeeping is imposed by law in certain areas of, of the value chain, the controls are relatively simple to apply as well. And so I, I'm, I don't think it's inconceivable. The corporate profits, that's a different debate. There you have problems of jurisdiction and the OECD process is slowly making some progress, but it's not gonna solve it overnight. But what the state first requires is a slice of the pie. 
and it can get the slice of the pie upstream with transaction tax as well as downstream on profits. Do you, do you think that um, the various policy discussions there have been about some concept of a citizen's income, you mentioned that earlier on, that that's a viable proposition in the longer run? I mean, uh, for example, there are some states which provide a kind of citizen's income. One of them is Norway, I think. Mm -hmm. One of them, strangely, is Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And there may be others. Um, I, I, that that's one way of, of addressing a world in which <laughs> machines do most of what we call work. Um, and citizens do something else. But, but at the same time, you, meet, you, 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 you avoid the, the huge inequality problem you would get um, if, if the rewards of, of the su successful deployment of, of automation were simply to flow to the owners of the, of the automation. As you no, correct, but it seems to me that that's the big social and political consequence of the displacement. If, the di if you know, your, your mind experiment, if, if the displacement is near total, then either Luddism becomes everybody's favorite sport or the state somehow organizes a better safety net over the top of which people can be more or less, less creative. So a living household income as the minimum instead of a minimum wage, which would then make you a bit more relaxed about the, uh, the relative hourly rates for the sorts of work that people might do and would leave people more choices. Now, that's very theoretical, uh, but you, you would then need to say, so how much would it be and where would we get the money from? I think the Finnish, the fin it's just a proposal, I think, from the Finnish Prime Minister, but the Finnish Prime Minister's proposal is it's more or less balanced funding, and by the way, you save a lot of transaction costs in terms of working out which of 23 benefits each individual can claim. So, th so there's a simplification argument as well as a social justice, as well as a, a sort of, in a way, an innovation supportive argument because in a world where household income has a, a reasonable floor, people will be a bit more relaxed about the implications of change. Otherwise, we will all be, all of us, yeah. I guess, against change. A question uh, from Soch more of a social perspective. So if, you, if we've got two speeds in a society, so one will be the owners of automation and people working on automation on systems uh, that spit out um, products of industry, be it uh, physical material or um, digital. But then you've got all those populations which become a majority which is excluded from the economy. And what from, do you- Excluded from? From the economy. Uh -huh. So if you, your, your solution was to give those people a basic income, is it? But then if, you, if you've got them on a basic income, they, they do not share, they're not um, being taken apart in the automation process and the economy as I understand will be just automation. So is, is there any policy you could think of that helps those people educate them and bring them within, uh, within this um, activity which is profitable? So, so, so this, uh, yeah. I understand the question. I mean, I think this is where, I this is where my very first point is relevant. That that the system is going to evolve in a way that we may not be able to predict and certainly cannot determine. In other words, if the the next step is not necessarily that every household with a minimum income and no full time forty hour salary at job suddenly becomes uh, unemployed, it may well be that they do other things. And you will find, so in other words, I, you know, I, I, I believe rather viscerally that social utility is what drives us. And therefore, if we're not going to starve to death, but we don't have something to do, we will make sense of our lives in other ways. And those other ways may well be part of a monetary economy, or they may be part of a sharing and barter economy, or they may be part of a caring economy. I don't know. But, but the, the missing piece, I think, in, in between your proposition and the question is we don't know what people will do. We don't know how society will evolve in a world where the things that we pay bankers and insurance brokers and maybe even doctors to do today are 
in part or largely done by artificial intelligence. We don't know what will happen next. I don't think what will happen next is everybody sitting at home watching the television, I hope. And so, you know, what will we do for these people? I think the, the key point which was raised earlier is we need a different sort of education for this world. And by the way, the world is maybe 25 years away, not 250 years away. So today's primary children need to be educated for this world. And then we'll see what they do. Along the lines of this point you've just made, you did mention something about skills for a digital future. Mm -hmm. Could you summarize those skills? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, I mean, digital skills, there's a definition of that. But I, th I think what I'm saying is that's not the point we should be worrying about in this strategic debate. We should be looking at the sorts of skills that get embedded before the age of 10. Well, so creativity, inventiveness, uh, interpersonal skills, team building uh, skills, team working skills, the sorts of things which in many Western educational systems we almost educate against them or we ignore them. And so the, the two no regrets priorities for primary education I've taken away from conversations with experts. I don't have a theory of my own. One is um, embodied cognition. So to begin again to treat young people as if they have a brain in a body. So everything that is uh, physical, mindfulness, stuff like that. But on the inventiveness side, there is evidence from I think, the, the American Academies of Science. They took all the people who patented more than one thing in a couple of cohorts, and they went back and tried to see what correlated more strongly with these people than with the population at large. And one thing that they identified rather strongly was that before the age of 10, they were doing, making, tinkering, hands-on, craft-type things, either at school or at home. And that correlates positively even with patents in sort of completely non-mechanical engineering things. And I think that you know, those, two, those sorts of um, data points invite us to revisit the early years of education rather radically because everything that happens afterwards is uh, of secondary importance. Yes. How would you describe it as relevant in education for a child? Very concretely. Well, very concretely. Uh, um, before, before the coalition government abolished it, uh, primary schools could have access to seed funding for um, non-curricular activities. And one very popular non-curricular activity in many relatively uh, un deprived areas in primary schools was yoga for kids. And the before and after experience of doing classroom yoga for troubled individuals, getting a bit more sense of self-worth, self-control, were huge. And then Mr. Go came along and abolished it under the coalition. So there's, there's evidence there in the education sphere of things that work, and we do them marginally instead of mainstream. One uh, final question, Robert, which is, uh, have, have you been surprised by the resurgence of interest in, in automation in the this new context? The resurgence of interest. So if, if well, I mean, bear in mind, for the last six years, that sort of stuff's been absolutely my bread and butter. So I regard it as the world catching up with reality. And when we did, uh, we, from uh, 2012, 13, 14, we ran, in my bit of the commission, a digital futures exercise, a sort of networked foresight. Yeah. And this stuff was very clear. It wasn't as deep. We didn't have all the evidence points. But the fact that these things are coming is very clear to the community that works around um, information technologies and their application in society. So I'm, no, I'm not very surprised. And I, I think what is always surprising and a bit irritating to us Europeans, as it were, I don't just mean people working in Brussels, is you know, the, the, the poster child of autonomous driving is the Google car, whereas there are much more beautiful examples coming out of Munich and Stuttgart, which are actually also, in my view, more savvy um, predictions of what it will take to get autonomous cars into the city 
because they're not just looking at will it drive around safely, they're looking at things like what signaling system will make a pedestrian feel safe in the presence of these cars. And the answer there is, is, is you need a whole new look and feel with um, targeted sound to warn that pedestrian that the car can see that I'm coming. It goes to the point where the, the car, the, this is the, um, the Daimler concept car, it stops and it projects a pedestrian crossing onto the roadway so the little old lady knows that it wants <laughs> her to cross. Now, whether, whether in the production model it will go that far, I don't know, but uh, what that shows, and it, it, in a way it's a reason for confidence rather than fear of automation, is that the companies that are doing this stuff understand that citizens have to want to adopt it, like any innovation. It's not going to happen unless there's some pull. There are some areas where AI can be done to society, but when it gets into the B2C space, individuals have to relate to the technology. As, as somebody who drives a Prius, um, I have learned to be terrified of going to supermarket car parks <laughs> because I know that people can't hear it. Yeah. And it's uh, actually a disability of the car. It ought to have some big honking noise. Or, or a projection or something. Or a cowbell. Something. It has to be something. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Pleasure. Um, uh, and uh, next speaker is Willie Brown.